Uh, Jerry, your last choice. Okay, um, my last choice is uh, David Lean. Not another grand scale. Yeah, right. I know, I'm sorry. I just had to. No, I, mean, no, no, no. I didn't want to change it. Now, I will tell you, though. I will tell you. Um, I I was flirting with John Borman and um, Paul Thomas Anderson, too, but you, you said five, and I didn't know how you could get seven in there. So uh, <laughs> those are two others, though, that were that were heavenly considered. And actually, I don't know why Borman, I don't know how I dropped Borman out. I don't know what happened, um, but it just did. But no, David Lean, um, it would be really irresponsible not to put him on here, um, not just for Lawrence of Arabia, but also um, before Lawrence, I saw Bridge on the River Kwai in the theater, and that was really mesmerizing. Um, but you know what? Of all of his films, the one I really go back to the most, or used to go back to a lot, is Dr. Zhivago. Mm. I love that movie. I love everything about that movie. Um, I, there's not a, I mean, and I love all the Maurice Girard um, music that goes along with all all the movies that they, they did together. Um, I went back after reading the uh, Kevin Brownlow uh, book, biography um, on him, and I'm staying up late one night watching Ryan's Daughter. I didn't think it was as bad as everyone makes it out to be. I know I said that a couple of weeks ago on the show, but it's really not. It's actually a fascinating film um, to watch. And I think Passage of India is beautiful. It doesn't always work, but it's a beautiful film. But here's another guy. He didn't make a lot of movies towards the end. And there was a lot that he wanted to make. Uh, he wanted to make the, um, the his own version of The Bounty, and he wanted to make Joseph Conrad's Nostromo into a movie, which they did make it into a masterpiece theater, if I'm not mistaken, in the 90s. But he wanted to make that with Brando um, at some point, and that never happened. Um, and it's just a fascinating, and it's just larger than life films, but I, I have to say, seeing Lawrence of Arabia on the big screen in 1989 was the adult equivalent of the first time you see Star Wars in the theater. It's, so true it's something mesmerizing. Just, it's just out. Just it's just never like seen that. anything like it. It's just <laughs> amazing, epic um, storytelling and grand um, vision out there. That's like just unbelievable. It's just wow. I didn't know you you could do that. You could tell these stories, and they're amazing. There are other directors. I mean, it's really interesting. Um, before these directors, like we would go, we saw like John Huston's The Man Who Would Be King in the theater. Or John Milius is the Wind and the Lion. Very. These are movies I grew up with, and I we would walk up the street to see in the movie theaters in the '70s um, when we had a movie theater near here, and it was just these movies blew me away. But then you see where they all come from, and they all of them, all these Milius and um, Houston. You see, they all come from Lawrence, really. Lawrence is the um, the biggie. That was the one that when Angelica Houston always says that when they went to go see it, she said that her their father said, we're going to see something we've never seen before. So this is going to be a night you're going to remember. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, uh, and his his movies are spellbinding. Um, even some, I like Summertime with uh, Catherine Hepburn. I think that's, that's such a different movie from him. I was going to, I was going to mention that, you know, uh, of course, his career, you know, spans a lot further back than just, you know. Oh, yeah. The 60s, mm-hmm. Great Expectations. It's to the 40s and the 30s. But, yeah, Great Expectations. Brief uh, Encounter. Uh, a Brief Encounter, which is one of the great small movies of yeah. all time. Like, mm-hmm. uh, that's that's just about, you know. And he did Hobson's who, Choice, right? Hobson's Choice he did. Hobson's mm-hmm. Choice. And also, uh, also Oliver Twist. He did a great version of Oliver Twist. Oliver Twist, yes. Oh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, he was he he was he was really a wide ranging uh, sort of uh, I mean, again, a, a sort of a humanistic kind of filmmaker. <laughs> that uh, you know, but uh, Bridge Over the River, River Kwai was the moment that was the film that sort of made him into uh, just sort of a larger than life. Uh, sort of uh, mm-hmm. uh, filmmaker, even though you know in reality he was really kind of a small sort of you know little gray headed man kind of uh, right right <laughs> but, uh, no, you know you're right you're right uh but uh and and very proper and and prim uh but 
uh, but these movies, I mean, when you think about that guy taking, <laughs> I mean, when you think about the making of Lars of Arabia, taking yeah. that film crew out into that desert, having For what, two years. a film what, crew, two years? yeah, having a film crew, this guy battled the elements like no other filmmaker has ever battled the mm-hmm. elements. So particularly like with Ryan's Batman daughter, movie, with Ryan's daughter, with the rainy, the rainy Irish uh, countryside, which uh, which bedeviled him throughout that entire production, mm-hmm. and then and then you go to the snows of uh, the snows of Russia, you know, for Doctor Shivago. I mean, this guy, this guy, towards the latter part of his career, just said, okay, well, I'm just going to go out there and I'm going to conquer the earth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to go and conquer the earth, and I'm going to make this thing. And I don't care what the earth tries to do to prevent me from doing it, but I'm going to... Yeah. Quite, the antithesis. Yeah. Yeah. Quite the antithesis of how the Pal Pressburger movies, which were all done on sound stages. Right. And everything. And that's what, and I love those movies, too. Um, Black Narcissus, oh, my God, I love that movie. But um, it's just amazing, just... You know, it's like we were talking about Coppola, you know, about the technolo- technological changes, and, you know, Coppola says, I, I really didn't mind, you know, I, I don't miss being out there. <laughs> he prefers, the, you know, <laughs> the smaller films and doing it, you know, the technology and everything, digital technology and everything. And he goes, this is actually more for my style than being mm-hmm. out there in the swamp or whatever. I mean, you you can kind of make a case that, that – um, David Lean actually sort of broke uh, broke uh, the movie's sort of addiction to being on sound stages and and said, mm-hmm. you know, if you really want to if you really want to make your movie pop, you need to get out there in the real world. And who and really did that? Who really did that? Really, to extremes is Warner Herzog with the Gray Wrath of God and Fitz Mm-hmm. I mean, you're really you going out. Wouldn't have, you probably wouldn't have those two movies if you wouldn't if you didn't have David Lean. I think David Lean that's, that's sort true. of that's might have point. showed showed Herzog the way. You know, mm-hmm. uh, well, there's mm-hmm. a lot of way. filmmakers that have been greatly inspired by Lean. I mean, Spielberg, uh, chief. Spielberg is them. is a great is is, is the, I mean the chief of all of them. Yes. Yeah. You I, know, I I, I, good... I I don't know a lot about David Lean except this. I know that he wasn't very good at dating. <laughs> hey, well, he, he, he was. He got married six times. I mean, try dating. <laughs> well, what That's good. I like that. That's good. Desert, when you're out in the desert for three years, you think that marriage is going to last? Of course not. <laughs> you and Johnny Carson um, <laughs> and Liz Taylor, but um, but you know, but going back to you about Spielberg, I don't. You know, I'm. You know, I didn't put him on this list, but there's his influence. I mean, I think on our show and on our lives is, you know, unavoidable. I mean, he he's just someone. I'm I'm very happy that I got to grow up in his, you know, while his films were being, while he's alive and while his films remain, because they had a huge impact. I mean, let's be very honest: Raiders of Lost Ark, Jaws, Close Encounters, um, those along with the Lucas, like the Star Wars film. Those got me interested in the films and opened me up to what he was influenced by. And, he, you know, Spielberg is, like we, we talked about many times, it was just a treasure. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's vital. I, I don't know how else to say it. And he grows as a filmmaker, too, I think. So, Well, and Spielberg really, um, and I, I think Scorsese did, too. I mean, they, they were behind the revival of Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah. And that kind of revitalized his presence. The following year, he got the AFI Lifetime Achievement Award. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I, I think that was a <clears throat> that was a resurgence in his career, brought on by the people that uh, were inspired by him. Yeah, because you had I mean, and he was very ill, and um, you know he was going to make it. There was another movie, obviously, but he just didn't. He was very ill. He didn't get to make it, obviously, but. I mean, because he only had, I mean, there's only, what, Passage to India and Ryan's Daughter. And there's a huge gap in between those films. Um, and I think it was with Ryan's Daughter he was crucified for. Yeah, um, yeah that must have taken, taken a taken lot taken to cash for that. 
And I, you know, like we're talking about Sergio Leone, I mean, I think that took a lot, that took the wind out of his sails, I think. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's a shame we never got more. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that. And and as we said, as we spoke about with Ryan Sauter a few weeks ago, I still think that Ryan Sauter is a tremendously misunderstood movie. I think, uh, I think one of the reasons that Ryan's daughter is misunderstood is because the the first you know up until that point with Kwai and Arabia and Chicago, uh the movies those three movies so perfectly meld together mm-hmm. the the feeling of the epic storytelling along with a, sort of a political sort of statement and uh, unfortunately there's uh there is a political element in Ryan's daughter, but it comes a little too late in the movie to make an mm-hmm. impact. Uh, right. it, comes, it starts coming in like about 30 minutes after the intermission, uh, and uh, and and it feels a little tacked on. And I think I, I think I mean when we think of Ryan's daughter, those of us who love it, it's not that element of the movie that resonates. Right. Like like the, that element resonates in those other three movies. It's the element of uh, it's the element of the small movie that mm-hmm. he was so famous for early in his career with things like Brief Encounter. It's that element of the small movie uh, that's writ large that right. actually uh, impacts uh, those who do like Ryan's Daughter, and that, that is sort of a cult movie. I would say I would. I would consider that like one of his few like cult movies. Like, right. Uh, mm-hmm. It's only a small amount of people who really love that movie, I think. Uh, right. But it's out there. Um, right. And then, you know, I mean, we can't forget, you know, uh, Passage to India, which was, uh, I think, still a wonderful movie. Uh, it's uh, It's not a movie that a lot of people go back to. Um, but that doesn't mean they shouldn't. It's uh, great, you know, great performances. A lot of great performances in it. It is. It, it's a very mysterious story, and and mm-hmm. if you watch it, if you watch it, it asks you. It does not tell you what to think. It asks you to make your own mind up. What happens mm-hmm. in those caves uh, and so forth. So it really, it really, it takes. It takes kind of a chancy leap for uh, uh, for um, for David Lean. He took a sort of a chancy leap for that movie. I mean, not something that he wasn't unfamiliar with. Was something you like, couldn't uh, make that uh, today. You, yeah. you couldn't do that without Guinness today. Though there's no way you could have you know a British actor play yeah an Indian. It's the first thing I think of when you because that, even at the time that came out, that's eighty four, eighty five. That was even then considered like almost unnecessary. You could have got, you know, you could have gotten an Indian, an Indian actor to play the part. There was some a little bit of controversy with that, but I won't lie. Alec, well, Alec, Alec Guinness is wonderful in it. But I don't know why that needs to be. And I need to know what you're talking about there, and that was controversial. But I think that was misguided because just a couple of years earlier, there was a British man who won for playing Gandhi. <laughs> exactly. Not even a couple of years. Only like two two years ago. Like two two years, I think, I, before that. I think um, people were mad at that. There was a certain amount of people who were mad at that movie for not being Gandhi. Uh, but that. Oh, I agree. Yeah, it I mean, was. <laughs> it wasn't Gandhi. <laughs> it's a he different story, dude. It's to make Gandhi, <laughs> but uh, he didn't. So. Okay, half hour left. Dean, what is your last choice? Oh, my last choice, well, it just has to be. First of all, tell me how difficult the process was. To... <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm still grappling with it. I have five five filmographies right in front of me, and I'm looking at it, and it's just, I don't know. I'd just be betraying myself if I didn't say that it was Stanley Kubrick. It's just, it, it would be a betrayal. And okay, you know what? We're in to... luck because Stanley Kubrick was my fifth director too, so we can double up. Yes, it's time saver. That's I, great. I, I thought. I thought. God, that, I feel like a loser. I didn't up. pick. I should have picked Kubrick. I could. I could have picked Kubrick. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, I'm unlike you, Jamie. Uh, I 
if I understand you correctly, that you've come to love Kubrick later on in your life, uh, relatively recently. Yeah. Uh, that uh, the, the Kubrick, the appeal of Kubrick was something that eluded you. Yeah. But that's not the case with me. When I was 11 years old, uh, the lady that taught me how to read, she said she actually said I already knew how to read. She she just was there feeding me the stuff that needed to be read. But uh, but I always say that she's the lady that not only taught me how to read books, but taught me how to read movies. She took me to see a movie that I had always wanted to see. And uh, I remember my parents uh, being in the back seat uh, and uh, driving home from some thing that we saw at the drive-in. And my parents being in the front seat and talking about this movie. So you remember that movie? Uh, of course, they said the title of the movie, and they say, oh, it had a baby at the end of it. And then what the hell was going on in that movie? I just don't know. I still don't get that movie. And they were just so frustrated about this film. And I remember being in the back seat saying, i got to see this movie. Of course, that movie is 2001, and this is the movie that... that uh, I love that. I knew what you were talking about when you said baby. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the movie is 2001, and Jane took me to it. I saw it in, in, uh, on the big screen for the first time. And uh, it felt like, even though I was always a movie lover, uh, since I was a little baby, uh, my first memories are being at the theater. But even though I was always a movie lover, it felt like I had never seen a movie ever before. Mm-hmm. I, I I felt like some veil had been lifted. Uh, I felt, you know, interestingly enough, I felt that I got that movie from the moment I saw it. And when I went back and researched it later on, primarily through that book that Jerome Angel came out with called Making of Kubrick's 2001, which I only saw as a uh, as a as like a, a paperback book that was always in the used bookstores. You know, you could always find a copy of that book. I must have gone through 10, 15 copies of that book in my lifetime because they just, they just fall apart. I just look at them so much. But I remember picking that book up after watching it, and it has a that book has an incredibly – uh analysis of 2001 in it that was sent to Kubrick and approved by Kubrick. Uh, it was sent to him by a 17-year-old New York high school student named Margaret Stackhouse. And she actually broke 2001 down into sort of a uh, sort of a three-act kind of, I don't know, mathematical equation of some sort. And I read this, and I was like, yes, I got this. I knew it. I knew it. Why is everybody so confused by this movie? I just don't get it. Why are people confused? And, of course, I read the book, and it had it had letters to Kubrick from people that said, oh, why did you make this movie? And then it would have uh, other letters that said, you inspired me to look beyond the stars, and then a then a letter, uh, a, a cable from uh, you know Federico Fellini that said it was the most incredible thing he'd ever seen, and and just this divisive sort of back and forth about this film. Yes, it was a confusing film, I guess, for some people, but it also spoke to a lot of people to the point where it was a huge money maker, uh, and it wasn't just a huge money maker as some people like to say because it was released during the the era of the hippies and people were dropping acid. There's not that much acid in the world, okay? <laughs> there's, there's not everybody was going to see 2001 who loved it was dropping acid and smoking a doobie before they went in. That that was just some sort of way to dismiss it. That movie That movie is unlike anything. There's nothing like it. There never will be anything like it. There will never be anything made that's anywhere remotely as good. There's not another movie ever that will be made that is as ambitious, that dares to tell the story of the entire 
course of humanity from ape to superhuman. Uh, 2001 aside, then I was a huge fan of 2001 at 11. It didn't take me long to find Dr. Strangelove on mm. television. Dr. Strangelove was one of the funniest, but yet creepiest, weirdest sort of amalgamations of emotions that I've ever had, particularly watching it on television. I think it works very well on television because it's framed in that way, you know. Um, But that just sort of, uh, that sense of uh, sort of, well, I mean, there are a lot of moments in that movie that almost feel like a documentary. Uh, Mm -hmm. All of of the scenes in the B-52 with Slim Pickens. Uh, a lot of the scenes that take place outside of the Burbleson Air Force Base with uh, with uh, Sellers and and uh, and uh, Sterling Hayden, uh, all of those scenes that take place outside of that Air Force Base when they're trying to shoot up the Air Force Base, trying to mm-hmm. get to General Ripper. General you know, Ripper. Those, oh God! <laughs> you look at those scenes now. And they're obviously, you know, as in many of Kubrick's movies, Kubrick was a master photographer who had worked as a as a 17-year-old uh, New Yorker, had worked for uh, Look Magazine, and had been a, a accomplished still photographer for quite a number of years before he even picked up a movie camera, uh, like in the late 50s, mid-50s. Uh, but... You look at those scenes where he's filming almost like uh, sort of newsreely kind of war footage outside of that Air Force base. You see so much of uh, something like, you know, Saving Private Ryan, you know, in those sequences. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, they're referenced a little bit in in, uh, in another Kubrick movie, Full Metal Jacket. Um, okay, so then there's that. Later on, it, took, it only took me a little while to discover Paths of Glory. And again, Paths of Glory, which I still consider to be the, my second favorite uh, Kubrick movie. Paths of Glory, when you put in Paths of Glory now, it's a 90-minute movie. But it has such narrative drive that... I swear, it really feels like it's like ten minutes long. It, it never, it never fails to amaze me. I just watched it again just, just a few weeks ago, and I was just like, it, it just, it just never dies. How great that movie is! Uh, it, it just, it just snaps on by, and it just gut punches you with just, and so simply, just the absurd folly of wartime uh, morals. Um, okay, Paths of Glory aside, Clockwork Orange. Then you get into then you get into another morality play, a morality play that's about what is it to be human, what is it to be truly good. Are you still truly good if you're forced to be good? Isn't it really the choice between good and evil that makes us human? And if we have the choice to make people good through technology, should we take that choice? That's what that movie is all about. It's not about the joy of violence and all that stuff. That's what it's about. It's a basically Christian message. Very surprising coming from somebody who has been characterized as being nihilistic. Barry Lyndon. A beautiful, beautiful movie about a complete naive kind of dunce. You know. He's kind of just sort of blown away through through the ashes of history, even to the point where at the end of the movie all it's the the placard that comes up on the screen that says Good or bad, all of them, all of these people are in the same place now. They're all in the grave, and it doesn't matter who they are, because it's all about the ephemeral quality of history and the ephemeral quality of just about everything that we do. 
no matter how important we think it is at the time, it's about it's all going to go away. Then The Shining, which was incredibly drugged when it came out. Now it's considered, now it made the top 250 movies of all time in the in the BSI list that was just released a, a few weeks ago. Why? Because it's incredibly, uh, like, emotional. Uh, you can feel that he put everybody in that movie through the ringer. He did it on purpose. That was his way of creating horror. Now, I don't want to get into all the different things that Room 237 and and this, this show has gone to about about you know the different readings and so forth like that. Even if you don't read anything into it, the movie is still effective as a straight horror movie with incredibly uh, weird, creepy elements to it. Things that are unexplained, and the unexplained is obviously the most horrific thing that we can think of. Um, that's that's what makes that movie great. It has dread written all over it. Okay, Full Metal Jacket, a movie that I know that Jamie has a hard time with, but Full Metal Jacket is another film that basically shows, you know, what's interesting about Full Metal Jacket is it's basically one of the only movies out there that's a two-act movie. It's not a three-act movie. It's a two-act movie. And it basically has no ending. They go off into that into that field singing the Mickey Mouse theme, and then it just keeps going on and on. War is not something that's ever going to be eradicated. That's what that movie is all about. It's not ever going to be eradicated. It's something that men love. They do it because they love it. It is about the essential killer nature of man. And that's its that's its rigid doctrine. Finally, Eyes Wide Shut. I saw Eyes Wide Shut, of course, like we all did, Month after Kubrick had died, and I went to a preview screening of it, and I knew that this was the last time I was ever going to go see a Kubrick movie. And this movie was, I just feel, you know, I feel like, you know, Eyes Wide Shut might be the one movie of his that's actually influenced by another filmmaker, which would be a, sort of a David Lynch Influence, and I know that, that Kubrick was a huge fan of David Lynch, particularly of Eraserhead. And I feel like Eyes Wide Shut is not only a movie uh, uh, that's obviously a movie about marriage and trust and what it takes to keep a good marriage going, uh, and um, and the level of communication that's needed, and we have to remember that Eyes Wide Shut was a movie that he struggled with for years. I mean, he was talking about doing Eyes Wide Shut since the 70s. And he brought it to his wife, and his wife, whom he had been married to at the end, by by the end he'd been married to her for 45 years or whatever. Um, uh, he brought it to her, and she said, I just don't know. I just don't know about this movie. And the reason they didn't know about it was because it was a movie about marriage and and it was a movie that probably engendered some 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 fights between them, you know. And I bet he found that interesting. I bet he found it interesting that this was a movie. This was the idea. This was a movie idea that he had brought to his wife, whom he obviously loved, and it, it created uh, maybe some sense of rancor between them a little bit, you know. And uh, and that might have been something that he kept into his he kept in his mind. He he might have found that fascinating. He was obviously a, a, you know a loving husband, and you know even though he's married three times in his career or in his life, but you know the last one really took obviously. Yeah, and he was obviously a loving uh, father, 
And uh, yes, you know, he was. I would. I don't think that he was a recluse. I, he just didn't need to leave because the world came to him. Uh, I, you know, eyes wide shut is interesting for all of those, for all of these reasons. You know, this the sort of the sort of playing with dreams, the sort of the sort of uh, the recognition always that we're watching a movie and and that the watching of movies is like dreaming, um, and um, and you can't always be sure of what is real and what is not. Uh, you know, when you wake up from a dream, sometimes you don't know whether what you've been. I mean, I've woken up from dreams and think, thought, yeah, I really can fly. I can fly. I do it all the time. <laughs> you know, and then I remember, no, I can't fly. You know, <laughs> that's what that movie is all about. That movie is all about, you know, the sort of interplay between dreams and what dreams, what dreams actually reveal to us about ourselves. It's not just about marriage. Uh, it's it's about dreams, and it's also about the act of watching movies, eyes wide shut. Um, you know, finally, I just want to say this. There will never be another film director ever in the history of movies that has has the kind of influence, the kind of power, uh, the kind of just uh, exacting eye to the point where it was ridiculous. I mean, we've seen. Hopefully, you guys have seen that documentary, Stanley Kubrick's Boxes, which is about his huge you know, collection of files of about mm-hmm. all of his movies that he collected over the years, thousands and thousands of boxes on his estate in Borehamwood in England. Um, and, uh, I mean, he actually had, you know, uh, photographers for Eyes Wide Shut go and photograph almost every single square inch of London, you know, to the point where they had, where the photographer actually was was said he had to go out and photograph every single uh, building on this street. But Kubrick didn't want the photograph to be taken from the ground. He wanted it to be taken from the air. So this photographer actually had to go out, and the photographer was actually his nephew, I think. Uh, and this photographer had to actually go out with a 12-foot ladder and then climb up the ladder, take the photograph of the building, then go down 10 more steps, climb up the ladder, take a photograph of the next building, and then tape it all together. And then when Kubrick, when Kubrick finally saw the whole thing taped together, this, this look of this entire street, just, just hearing a 60-foot photograph, panoramic photograph, taped together for him, he said, boy, it's sure a lot better than going there, isn't it? <laughs> and that's, I mean... The guy just nobody is ever going to be able to do what he did, ever. That's why it'd be remiss for him, for me not to put him number one on this list. Well, uh, I mean, I've kind of talked myself to death on Kubrick, but I could not put him on my list either. I, I will say a couple of things, one of which came to mind today, because a lot of times when you talk about the the aspects that make a director great. Mm-hmm. You talk about he knows exactly what he wants. You, you hear actors say that a lot, like what makes a great director, somebody that knows exactly what they want. I don't necessarily, I've never gotten the sense that Kubrick actually did. Uh, he worked in a very different way. He worked in a kind of way where I know what I want when I see it. Surprise me. When I see something that's surprising, I'll know that that's the moment. That's the magical moment. That's the big reason why he spent so long making movies. He was mm-hmm. constantly searching for that moment. Um, and I don't. I think it's a mistake to think that there is an absolute reading on some of his films. Um, and I and and honestly, he he didn't actually tell the Margaret girl that she got it right. No, he said it was a very cogent reading. Yeah, because he actually has a quote that says, uh, the second you tell somebody what your movie's about, it ceases to be about anything. Uh, 
Right. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I agree that, with that. Yeah. That, that's the enduring power of his, of his work. And it's not just The Shining. It's most of his films are critically derided at the time of their release. And and as the years went by, they were appreciated in a greater way because he makes the kinds of movies that constantly reveal different layers to you. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, they, they're, they're the definition of movies that live. Um and in a way that the other other directors can't can't compare. I mean, they they don't have the level the level of ambiguity. The the strange kind. Of, it's a strange tone in his films because at first you view them as kind of detached, but then as you get deeper and deeper into them, you you start to feel them, and and I I start to realize well, they're not so detached. It's just a different way of approaching a film because usually for me, when I view a film, the way I get into it, the first way I get into it is from an emotional standpoint. And, and for me, the way I got into Kubrick films was was not first and foremost emotional. It was it, kind of an intellectual process. And as soon as I got the the think of it, I got the feel of it. Mm-hmm. And usually it's the opposite way around for me with directors. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously, I mean, he's he's a giant, and and there's ongoing explorations of what his films mean to uh, new generations that grow up with his movies. And what fascinates me aren't the wild theories about about him as a person or the wild theories about the content of his films. It's more about there's very few directors that you can explore in this way because they his movies don't dictate any anything really to you. Mm-hmm. You, you 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 have to find yourself in them. Uh you have to kind of navigate your way through them. And I think that if you don't like Kubrick, I mean and and I didn't I I didn't respond to him just because I didn't respond to that general tone. And generally with any director I don't respond to that tone. But I wanted to say, what am I missing with Kubrick? I didn't give him mm-hmm. a fair. Sh- I didn't give him a fair shake. So then, then that's when I embarked on this thing, and I watched all of his stuff, and I was receptive to them. I think that the majority of people that aren't receptive to him are just lazy moviegoers. After a certain point, you know, mm-hmm. they're not. They're not. They're not used to bringing themselves to a movie. They just let just let this movie happen to me. <laughs> but yeah. I mean. He's he's really a a director that every movie, every single movie. I mean, Barry Lyndon was dead dull. You know, it was like uh, upon his first release. Oh, this movie's so dull. It's like Kubrick doesn't know how to tell a story with any pulse whatsoever. <laughs> the years went by, and people people caught on. Oh, it's not just a beautiful looking movie. There is a beating heart in this thing, and I think it's also. It's something that he shares with Hitchcock and De Palma. There's a cool irony mm-hmm. at work. He's a very ironic filmmaker. Uh, and I think that turns some people off, and that goes over some people's heads as well. But I wanted to ask one question about something that you said, Dean, about Clockwork Orange. And that was something you said about it, it kind of reflecting Christian values, ultimately. What... what it, where do you see that? Well, in the fact in the fact that if a man is not given a choice, if a man is not given the choice to be good or evil, but has one of those choices foisted upon him, does that? And in this particular case, the choice is foisted upon Alex that he be good to the Liga Rico right. Are you not taking away his essential rights as a man to choose choose those two you know if you if you are a Christian you must realize that you have a choice always to be either good or bad. Now, I'm not going to say this with just Christian things, but this comes up in the movie 
through the uh through the character of the prison pastor um, who counsels Alex and and says and says, you know, uh Alex says, I really want to be good and he says, Well to only be good you must just be good. That is it. Mm-hmm. Uh but it is your choice, you know. This choice is taken away from Alex. Uh, right. And uh and this is what see, he becomes he becomes as in the the title of the Clockwork Orange. He becomes he becomes a yes, he's still an organic being, but he's a machine now. Uh and machines are just programmed, you know, and then we get back to how and so forth with two thousand and one. Uh, you know, Hal goes through the same thing. Is he? He's programmed to be the way he is. He's, uh, you know, I mean, this is a theme that goes through a lot of his movies. You know, uh, uh, even even Barry Lyndon and to some extent Shine, The Shining and and even you know Full Metal Jacket, uh, where those those men are are made into killing machines. They are no longer able to choose. Uh, whether they're good or not, you know. Um, the, these are this is this is a basically Christian message, you know. I'm not some guy that's trying to out here convert you to Christianity or anything like that. I'm not some kind of. No, you know, I know that. I mean, but, 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 know, but, but, but Kubrick. Uh, I mean, Kubrick and Christian don't have never really gone together for me. I mean, yeah. Don't you think that he's being in the clockwork orange, though, don't you think he's being sardonic by saying, oh, you know, if you want to be good, you just have to be good. He's well, all, but, uh, all but, making fun of but Christianity that's a kind of gray almost. Area. That, that's a gray area, too, because I honestly, yeah, think that, yeah. I, I honestly think that Kubrick believed we're all good and bad. I mean, we're, yeah. we, all, we all have both of these sides within us. It's, it's called human nature. Yeah. And yes, we, we have a choice of, 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 of which side we want to represent. But and I saw him explore those themes, and that's the problem I have with Full Metal Jacket, is that Full Metal Jacket finally, for me, felt like a, a, a retreading of, of themes that didn't live up to his prior explorations of those mm-hmm. themes. And he did return to certain motifs time and time again, but he returned to them and explored them in a, in a different way. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, The Shining has a lot of stuff that he explored before, uh, but in in a very different context. <laughs> yeah, uh, true. But uh, but I I the the movie that feels most mysterious to me now is Eyes Wide Shut. And because it's a I mean obvi- honestly obviously it's about a, a marriage in one sense of the word. There's a dream logic to it. There's there's this male female dynamic in the movie that's very fascinating to me. And how Tom Cruise is very, uh, I, the second time tonight I've used this word, very impotent in the movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and the, 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 the female kind of has such a tremendous amount of power. He also loved loved women. And I don't know necessarily that that, that, that aspect of his life really pops up that often. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. You're movies. right. Even though I do feel yeah. tremendous empathy with with Wendy, but in The Shining, but Shelley Duvall was cast essentially, I'm sure, not only because she's a capable actress, but because she looks like someone that would, just by looking at her, that would be completely subservient to Jack. Mm-hmm. That it, that would not be her necessarily her own woman. But I do feel an evolution in that movie where she she does finally have to take initiative in that film. And find the she strength. Re- that she, she, she finally has to realize she's. She, yeah. She finds the strength somebody. she didn't know that she had. Yeah. Yeah. She's with somebody that she suspected for a long time has had some serious problems, but here they are to the fore, and now she's got to do something about it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I mean, I like I, I like just a sort of a straight on look at, at at The Shining, and you know, I mean, I'm fascinated by all the theories and everything, but I just like to look at look at it. Straight, straight ahead is what I feel it is. Um, but uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, Eyes Wide Shut is is incredibly mysterious, and I still think to this day, 
I think it's it's going to be a little while before people catch up to it. Me too. Um, I mean, I and I think I think that movement's starting to happen. And and yeah. and and again, uh, I I don't love Kubrick movies because there's always different theories surrounding them. I mm. mean. I I I I I don't believe a moon landing thing, and but I, I I do I do I do believe you know the Holocaust could could have possibly been subtext in The Shining, and mm-hmm. in in no way does that diminish my appreciation of the movie, and and I don't understand people who feel threatened by it, like it somehow diminishes their their appreciation of the movie. Because people are violent, violent about it. It, it doesn't. Oh, I know you got some. So, so you, you said you got hate mail for that for that episode of that show, did you not? A lot of it, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, chill I don't out. know why people. <laughs> I don't know why people would send hate mail over uh, over it to anybody about any kind of uh, you know uh, you know whether it be you know the Dark Knight or whatever. Yeah. You know, I, I I don't think that that uh, movie is worth sending hate mail to anybody. You could spend your time sending hate mail to people who really deserve it, I suppose. Yeah. 